Hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here. Man, I can't even begin to tell you guys how long I've been waiting to cover the cultural origins of this game. Sakuna of Rice and Ruin has been on my radar since first hearing about it over three years ago. An interesting hybrid game that's one part balls pounding combo heavy combat of Masamune Demon's Blade or Odin Sphere, and the subtle, chill gameplay loop of farm sims such as Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley. And we all know how big of an audience those games have developed over the years. So what, like Rune Factory? Actually, yeah, kinda. But this being more of a side-scroller than an RPG. I thought the concept itself was kinda weird, but after playing it for myself at E3 2017, I knew I had to get my freaking hands on this game to analyze. Which, thanks to Xseed, I was able to pick up a review copy of it to get this video out just in time for the game's release. So, you are Sakuna, daughter of Akami of War and Akami of Agriculture. Thus, the inherent dichotomy of this game having both intense combat sections paired with heavy emphasis on farming. However, throughout the years, Sakuna's become spoiled, lazy, and hitting the sauce a little too hard. But don't worry, because as she says... <laughs> That is until one day Sakuna does a big no-no, gets exiled from the capital of the spirit world, and is tasked with clearing out the all-too-familiar Oni Island of all of its demonic denizens right out of Momotaro. All the while, you're joined by a group of humans trying to find their own place in the world, as well as a mysterious tribe of Kamitachi yokai, because they are absolutely Kamitachi, all together trying to take back the island from all manner of demon-possessed animals. And there's plenty of surprises along the way, including finding a helpful village of adorable Kappa. Anyway, as far as mechanics goes, while the frenetic combat itself can level up some of Sakuna's abilities through experience and what have you, what really powers her up is how well the player plants, grows, and harvests rice throughout the game loop. The better crops you grow, the more combat abilities and core stat boosts you get in-game. But here's the thing. For as much as I love intrinsic intense gameplay that beat em ups bring, and the vast cast of folklore charged characters this game has, I mean, heck, I'm only three chapters in and we're already finding civilizations of Kameitachi and Kappa, it's actually the farming element in Sakura that really got me invested in picking this game up. See, a farm style game looping by itself is already a pretty addicting and enjoyable thing on its own. I mean, after all, if it wasn't, Harvest Moon wouldn't be cranking out game after game for the last 23 years. But what makes Sakuna of Rice and Ruin so different and interesting compared to other farm sims, and why I've been so culturally hyped for it for three years, is that, like its cultural inspiration and origin of Japan, the growing, harvesting, and utilization of rice specifically is the core focus of everything in life from both a cultural perspective and a gaming perspective. From basic necessities like food materials to religious connections to the Shinto Kami themselves. Yeah, we may joke sometimes about Japan and rice, but in reality, it was absolutely no joke. From food, to finance, to faith, rice was such an integral pillar to Japan's very identity that without it, we'd likely have a much different country than the one we know today. I mean, for one, rice fundamentally made up Japan's currency for hundreds of years in the form of the koku. Koku referring to the amount of rice to feed a single person for one year. From what we've seen, the kokudaka, or the common tax levied on villages in Japan, was used from the Heian period in the late 700s all the way through the Edo period in the mid 1600s. It was the method in which samurai were paid by daimyo. In fact, it was the measure which daimyo could be called daimyo. After all, it took 10,000 koka to reach that lofty title. For almost 1,000 years, rice was the economy of Japan. It was the hard line that determined the worth of an individual and territories alike. So perhaps then it comes as no surprise that later on in the game, the rice you grow becomes your currency for purchasing imported goods. Not so unlike the old koku system. Well, there's more to the power of rice than just economics. There is a tremendous spiritual aspect of it seen both in-game and in real life. Take for example the hauling process of rice in this game. You could theoretically haul the rice by a small amount in order to get better food bonuses with brown rice, but by hauling and polishing all of the rice into white rice, Sakuna ends up getting some pretty insane stat boosts. This too has an intense connection to Shinto. With rice being the make or break of Japan's economy, active prayers and offerings were made to the various kami to ensure strong future harvests with a huge chunk of these offerings going to Inari Okan, god of harvest and rice. Oh, I guess that explains why over a third of all Shinto shrines are devoted to him, and why the Inari Fox Mask is one of the first pieces of headgear you unlock in-game. Hey, rice is money, it's simple business. But here's the thing, after a harvest of rice is gathered for the year, folks would take their most pure, polished white rice to be offered as thanks in hopes of having another strong harvest in the next year. But why specifically white rice? Because white is the color of purity. I mean, you see it all over the place in Shinto, from spiritual garb to iconic symbols. The whiter the rice, the purer and more powerful it was, and made for a much more fitting gift to the kami. 
This in turn empowered the Kami to create greater blessings in terms of good growth and harvest. It's a cyclical practice that's been going on in Japan for the better part of 2000 years up to modern day, and interestingly enough, is a concept that is actually thoroughly explained within this game. So bottom line, in Shinto, the wider the rice, the greater the gift of the Kami. The greater the gift of the Kami, the more empowered they are to provide a massive bounty for the next year. In game, the wider the rice, the greater the Kami, Sakuna, is empowered. It really is one of the greatest video game based explanations of the relationship between Shinto gods and the power of rice. But if you thought this game was only wrapped up in the supernatural elements when it comes to Japan's relationship with rice, you would be sorely mistaken. I have never in my life ever seen a farm sim game go 100% devoted and inspired by the traditional method that farming was done within a culture. This game is so well connected to the traditional farming and utilization of rice in Japan that you could literally look up the history of the cultivation process in real life and directly apply that to game. I had a theory. If I could understand the history behind Japan's agricultural practices of rice farming, it could give me a leg up in getting Sakuna stats as high as I possibly could to give me an edge in the game. As remember, your stat block and move list grows literally alongside how well you plant, nurture, harvest, thresh, and haul rice. And this game does not play around with how it grades your ability to farm. As previously mentioned, it's intense. So much so that you can change the farming difficulty before you get cracking. So, before I sat down with my review copy of Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, I spent a few days researching Japan's traditional methods of growing, harvesting, and utilizing rice. Starting from its introduction into the country all the way back to the 10th century BC, to the modern practices that Japan uses to grow and harvest rice today. And you know what? Using that knowledge alone, I was able to grow enough rice to last me the entire year in game, as well as crank up my stats to the point where I flew through the next two chapters of the story without ever having a single issue with enemies or combat. So if you want to get a head start in the game, as well as get some insight into how Japan grew the crop that made or broke its economy and native religion, grab a sickle and hoe and give a listen to the origin of Japan's most traditional pastime. Hey, by the way, why in the world was Rice Japan's pastime? Simple, actually. As traditional rice farming made its way into the country from China and Korea, the Yayoi people realized something amazing about the process as it grew in popularity from northern Kyushu all the way through Honshu proper. Japan had the perfect weather for rice cultivation. Rice requires a lot of moisture and a lot of heat, both of which Japan has in spades from about late May to the middle of September. More specifically, rice requires an average temperature of 70 degrees or higher for at least 3 months, and at least 45 inches of rain a year for it to germinate properly. Luckily for Japan, the country can average around 56.5 inches in a lot of different areas thanks to the summer's Suyu rainy season. And anyone living there can tell you that in the summertime, the moisture never really goes away, nor does the temperature even drop to anything below 80 degrees, even at night. These two factors of temperature and moisture play a huge role in game and will be the major determinant of how good your rice is and how strong your stats get. But I'm getting ahead of myself, because we gotta plant the freaking things first. When the blooming Sakura change from white to pink, the farmers get to work. First, tilling the soil like an absolute madman, because winter hardens the soil to a near solid state. And unlike most other crops, soil for rice has to be extra loose so the all-important water can run through it. And when it comes to tilling in-game, take your time. You really, really do have to spend a lot of the in-game day turning soil before it's actually ready. It's not about cutting lines, you gotta hammer the whole patty down just like Japanese farmers did. Next come the seedlings, a simple enough process. Farmers would hold onto trays of withheld rice seed, sowing it heavily within water until it sprouts and is ready for transfer. Thankfully, this is more of an automatic process in game, though the greater your previous yield, the more rice you can subsequently churn out. Thankfully too, in game you don't have to care for the seedlings in a nursery field like farmers in Japan had to do back in the day, but rather keep them in your storehouse. Now before anything though, you gotta get some good fertilizer together. Now for Japanese farmers, there were three key fertilizers that were required for solid rice crops. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And once you know it, Sakuna has similarly three forms of fertilizer as well. Though these are identified as leaf, root, and kernel fertilizer. So grab a bucket, go scoop the outhouse, and start mixing using materials that you pick up in the combat sections. Be careful though, because certain fertilizer is preferred by the rice at certain points in time. Now comes arguably the hardest part of the process both in-game and out. Planting. But first things first, you gotta flood that patty. Cause again, rice is the most demanding crop for moisture, and having just the right amount of water and temperature of water is what makes or breaks a good harvest in game and out. Basic rule of thumb, 
Water up to your ankles is typically the right amount for getting started. To do this, rice paddies have a perimeter of water that ran around the field. One gate's open near the source of the running water in order to flood the field, while there's another at the far end that's open in order to drain the water out. When planting, rice sprouts can't be too far apart or too close together. You have to imagine a tight grid and space the sprouts evenly, otherwise the crop will grow irregularly. And I will say this too, the controls and camera in this section don't help in any way, so just be careful. Though you know, the more I think about it, that might be intentional. There's a really cute point in the game that talks about how planting was so freaking backbreaking that farmers in Japan developed their own series of work songs, something that eventually began to take root in Shinto proper. Oh, and by the way, as spring moves to summer, there are a few techniques that traditional Japanese rice farming can help you out in the growth period. Farmers from the Yayoi to Edo period started to learn how to capitalize on natural pesticides and fertilizers. Crayfish, dragonflies, and frogs in Japan made the regular homes in rice paddies, and were even captured and released into the fields to keep out harmful pests and weeds. In-game? Man, I got nothing clever to say. All the creatures are just there, lock, stock, and barrel, ready to be picked up and released into Sakuna's field to keep pests down. You can find frogs, snails, and spiders all over the place, so do like the farmers of old did and catch as many as you can. All that's really left to do from there is to just keep the weeds out and maintain your water levels and temperature. Yeah, I still remember how loud those frogs got at night during summer. You think one field's bad? Try being surrounded by acres of rice fields and trying to sleep through that. Finally, at the tail end of summer, it's time to get reaping. Simple enough, right? Grab a sickle and get slashing. But just one thing, drain your field first. Folks in Japan knew the less water there was, the easier it was to get around and gather it. Same applies here. Get a higher yield by draining first. Following the harvesting, the rice needs to be dried which is traditionally done by tying the bushels together and letting them hang over a rack. Though I don't think the game does the process justice. From what I researched, folks had to climb ladders to get to the top of the racks that could be three to five rungs high. From there, it's time to thresh and hole. To do so, farmers in Japan would utilize the kokibashi, two long lengths of wood similar to chopsticks or bamboo that are tied together, and the ears of rice were squeezed through the press and the seeds popped out of the top. A process dating all the way back to the beginning of the 11th century. But that's not to say that's the only way of doing it. In the late 1600s, the creation of the Senbakoki, unique to Japan, definitely expedited the process. Basically, an iron tooth comb that would be more efficient threshing out seeds as well as save bodily energy. And thankfully, tools like this definitely pop up in-game, which cuts out a step or two in the QTEs that make up the threshing process. Next is hauling, and I think this is pretty self-explanatory. For farmers in Japan and Sakuna in game, rice was placed in large mortars and a pestle was used to crush the grains from their husks. Again, this was a critical time for farmers as well as the player. Because how much rice are you going to leave alone to make brown rice for better food, and how much are you going to pound into white rice for the above mentioned betterment of the kami? From there, harvested rice went into so many different important foods, processed or otherwise, as they do in game. They play a central role in the traditional style of meal called Peisho a style of meal omnipresent in this game that determines your food buffs. Within this meal style are a plethora of rice-based main dishes that you may never have heard of before. The salty sweet rice dish called Sekihan, which was made of white rice and anko bean paste, the crunchy dish Sansai Gohan made of rice and wild mountain vegetables, and the savory warming rice soup Zosui. But let's also not forget all of the processed foods that stem from rice. Soft sweet rice cake mochi as well as its hardened alternative that had insane preservation ability, yet could immediately melt back down into a gooey snack like the fire roasted aburi mochi, also seen in this game. And finally, this game has a weirdly huge selection of sake. Refined sakes like ginjo and daiginjo, various shochus, and some of the more unrefined sakes like amazake, doburoku, and the saliva fermented kyo that is kuchikami sake. Yeah, remember that scene from Your Name? Same process. But hey, just as the scene implies, it just goes to show that despite the practical uses for all this rice and rice-based food and drink, each one was used for an important ritualistic offering. Sake and mochi particularly were important for New Year's offerings. I just... I can't with this game. There's just so much more that I could go into. And I don't mean just the farming, I mean everything. All integrated subtly and naturally within the story and each of its characters. The nature of Kami and the relationship with mankind. The importance of Gokoku Hojo, or the five grains. Principles of Buddhism in the consumption of meat. Even, I kid you not, the rocky relationship that Japan had with Christian missionaries over the years. I'm only on chapter three of this game, and I've only just scratched the surface of how much history and culture is jammed in this game. I just... 
If you have any minor interest in traditional Japan, folklore, economy, sociology, history, anything, I mean anything, please pick up this game. As we speak over twitch.tv slash gaijinghuba every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 p.m. U.S. Central, I've been in the process of explaining and teaching every aspect of Japanese culture I've come across in this game. So if you missed out on those streams, I highly encourage you to check out those VODs. Heck, I might even just upload them here just so people don't miss out, despite the fact that that would be algorithmic suicide. I wish I could make more videos on this game, but Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity is coming around the corner and I have a shinobi waifu to thoroughly break down. So again, please go check out those streams and for the love of god, do not sleep on this game! The three year wait has been more than worth it in my eyes, so please go check it out. But if I don't see you on stream everyone, until next time, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.